I, I hope everyone had a really nice weekend. One thing I want to remind you of is that written homework number six is due tomorrow by midnight. So you'll need to go over to the assignments page on Canvas, get the assignment, and then upload your solutions in the same spot, you know, by tomorrow at midnight. It covers verifying differential equations and sketching. Slope fields is only about three problems, right? but give yourself a little bit of time to do it. Other than that, I don't think I have any announcement type things. Any questions that you have for me first? All right, so we are gonna finally finish off section 11.2 today, which was all about using different methods to approximate a solution to a differential equation. You know, we've seen slope fields or direction fields for a graphical approach, and shortly we're gonna see a numerical approach. Before that, I think now is a good time to discuss phase lines, so that's where I wanna start. We've seen that sketching the direction field for a differential equation is particularly easy whenever the equation has the form dy by dt is equal to some function just of y. Because in that case, the slopes in your direction field are identical along any horizontal line. Let's take a look at an example of such a differential equation and go through finding its slope field. So we've got dy by dx is equal to a function defined completely in terms of y here. You know, there are no x's on the right hand side. When we go to sketch the direction field, we start off by identifying the equilibria. All right, what are the zeros here? When is dy by dx equal to zero? what values of y. Good, at one, three, and five. All right, so those are gonna be our equilibrium points. And if we start to sketch the slope field, the derivative here is zero. So we're gonna have a bunch of little horizontal line segments at height y equal to one, y equal to three, and at height y equal to five. All right, now we need to figure out what's happening in between. Is the function you know, increasing, decreasing, what's going on? All right, so we'll pick test values. If you plug in something smaller than one, say zero, then Overall, the sign of the derivative is going to be negative. So along the interval minus infinity to one, we're gonna see negative slope across each horizontal line. If you plug in something between one and three, like two, then dy by dx is positive and the function's increasing. All right, so we're gonna see a bunch of little positive slopes. Anything between three and five is negative. And anything bigger than five is also negative. All right, so here's a very rough sketch of the slope field. Right, now I wanna put this together with something that we did back before the exam, which was use a number line to classify the equilibrium points. We break the number line up into intervals using our three points here. And then we've already know the sign of the derivative on each of the intervals. We just used it to make the slope field. It was negative, positive, negative, negative. And then remember the way this worked to classify them. Anytime you had a negative, you drew an arrow pointing to the left for that interval. And anytime it's positive, you draw an arrow pointing to the right. 
And that let us decide if it was stable, unstable, or semi-stable, right? We're basically just gonna put the two together and make a vertical number line instead. And that's what a phase line is. All right, so I'm gonna draw a vertical line here. Identify the equilibrium points. One, three, and five. Then anywhere the function is decreasing, so I see little line segments with negative slope, I'm going to draw arrows pointing down to indicate the function is decreasing there. And anywhere that I see a positive slope, we'll draw arrows pointing up to indicate it's increasing there. All right, so now we can use this to do things like classify the stability of the equilibrium. If I look at you know, y equal to 5, on one side I've got arrows coming in, on the other side arrows are coming out. What type of stability does 5 have? Good, it's semi-stable, exactly. Some solutions want to get to 5, others want to move away. 3, on both sides I've got arrows pointing in. So three would be a stable equilibrium, good. And how about one? Arrows pointing away on both sides. What's the stability there? Very good, unstable. Okay, so this is the phase line. It's basically the same thing we were already doing. We just kind of flipped it on our side. And then sometimes we, draw the slope field first if we want to use that to get the phase line. Other times, if you want to just go directly from the differential equation, you can do that. All right, let's do a second one just like that, where we sketch the phase line, figure out the nature of the equilibria. All right, first, give me the points I need to break it up by. What are my equilibrium points here? Good, one, two, and three. The zeros of dy by dx. All right, if I plug in something smaller than one, let's say zero, what's the overall sign of dy by dx? Negative, good. Yeah, we have three negative factors together, that's negative. All right, so below one, the function is decreasing and we'll draw arrows pointing down. If you plug in, say 1.5, something in the middle of one and two, dy by dx is positive and the function's increasing, so I'll draw arrows pointing up. In between two and three, if I plug in something like 2.5, we've got decreasing, and something bigger than 3, 3.5 increasing. All right, so here's our phase line. Let's go through. What's the stability for 3? Very nice, it's unstable. On both sides, the arrow is pointing away, so the function, the nearby solutions are going away. Two is stable, all the arrows are pointing into two. One is unstable, everything's going away. All right, one thing I particularly like using phase lines for is predicting the asymptotic behavior. It gives you a really quick way to figure out where the solution is going to go. All right, so let's do this one. Draw the phase line. The three equilibrium points are one, two, and three again, just like last time. One, two, and three, although slightly different behavior because the dy by dx has changed. If I plug in something smaller than one, it's decreasing, 
something between one and two, it's increasing. And then it's also increasing between two and three because of that y minus two squared happening. And then decreasing from three to infinity. All right, so now let's talk about a specific solution here. If we choose to let y of zero be equal to 2.1, all right, then we're starting off with y just about there at 2.1. And now if I let time run on and follow where that red point is going to go, where will it end up? Good, it's gonna go up to three. You know, I can follow the arrows, it's pointing up, the function's increasing, and then it's gonna hit the equilibrium and it can't cross that. You know, it's a horizontal asymptote. All right, so it's gonna stop at three. Y of t approaches three as t tends to infinity. We're gonna go up to three. All right, let me choose a different initial condition here. Let's take y of zero to be 0 0.5. All right, so now I'm starting out with the blue point down at the bottom here. What's gonna happen to the solution this time as t tends to infinity? Where's that point gonna go? Very good, minus infinity, exactly. Yeah, the function is decreasing from there on out, so it's just going to decrease off to minus infinity. All right, we see how this works for asymptotic behavior. Good. All right, let's finish the phase line material with one more example. I want to do this one just because I don't think we've done anything with a periodic function before, like sine. So let's take a look at dy by dx is equal to y sine y. All right, start off by giving me the equilibrium points. Where is that equal to zero? Good, we've got zero from either y or sine y. Pi coming from sine y. And then it repeats, right? It's zero at two pi, at three pi, going the other way around the circle at minus pi, minus two pi, minus three pi. All right, so we have a whole bunch of points here. All right, now let's look at what's happening in between. Starting with the interval zero to pi. If I plug in something between them, you know, like pi over two, y is positive and sine of y is positive. I'm looking at the, the top half of the plane. All right, so together, the sine is positive and our function's increasing. All right, moving to the interval pi to two pi, here, y is still positive, but sine is negative on the bottom half of the plane. All right, so altogether, we're going to get a negative, and it's decreasing. All right, what happens on the next interval between 2 pi and 3 pi? Will the function be positive or negative? Positive, good. This is where we've come back around again. All right, we're gonna to start to alternate between positive and negative as we move up the number line. All right, now let's go do the other side. If I plug in something between zero and negative pi, y is negative and sine of y is negative. All right, so together we get a positive in between minus pi and minus two pi, the product ends up being negative and then positive and then negative and it repeats. 
All right, so let's classify. Start off with the stable equilibria. All right, give me one value of y where it will be stable. Pi, good. Yes, at pi, the arrows are all pointing in. Or at three pi. Or at five pi. At two k plus one times pi. Where k greater than zero is an integer all the positive odd multiples. All right, and good, we've got another one at negative two pi. Again, looking at the phase line, we see the arrows are all pointing into negative two pi, so it's gonna be stable. So would minus four pi if we had extended the phase line long enough, and negative two k pi, all the negative even multiples of pi. unstable would be positive 2 pi, 4 pi, 2k pi, and minus pi, minus 3 pi, minus 2k plus 1 pi. What's the odd man out? Who are we missing? What's our semi-stable equilibrium looking at the diagram? Zero, good. It's the only one that's got you know arrows coming in one side and leaving the other one. All right, so we've classified all of them at this point. And now we've seen a case with a periodic function. All right, got any questions for me on phase lines, on using them for asymptotic behavior or for finding stability? Okay, so we finally get to Euler's method, which is our numerical approximation method. The basic idea that we used for slope fields, we can also use for a numerical approximation. All right, so I want to do the same thing where I'm going to start it off with this example dy by dt is equal to t plus y. And then we'll figure out what the method is afterwards. I'm also going to choose an initial condition, y of 0 is equal to 1. Then we know 0, 1 is a point on the solution curve. And at 0, 1, the slope is given by you know, dy by dt, which according to our differential equation is t plus y. All right, so plugging in at t equal to 0 and y equal to 1, the slope at zero one is one. All right, so one thing we could do to approximate our curve is use the linear approximation where we take the line of slope one passing through the point zero one. That would be L of t is equal to t plus one. All right, now this is a really rough approximation. In this case, I know what the solution curve looks like. It's or something kind of like this parabola. The initial condition is 0, 1 here. And then if we try to approximate this by the line t plus 1, the tangent line, we're trying to approximate it by, you know, a line when we have something that's curved. And so that's not great. You know, clearly, as soon as we get a little ways out, the line is getting very far away from the curve, right? So it's a bad approximation. Euler's idea is to take this and improve on it. By going just a little ways along the tangent line and then stopping and correcting and changing your direction once again 
according to the slope field. All right, so let me redraw the picture here. Again, I'm including the sketch of the solution, so I have something to look at, but usually we wouldn't know. Yes, a lot like the Taylor, Taylor's equation, where you're going in little steps, yeah. Right, so here we're gonna take it using the original tangent line, but I'm only gonna go out a little ways. Let's go out until T is, you know, say 0.5 along the T axis. I can figure out what the end point of this little green line segment is by plugging into the equation for the tangent line. L of 0.5 is 0.5 plus 1. L of t was t plus 1, or 1.5. All right, so the end point here is 0.5, 1.5. And now what we'll do is we'll plug in it to the differential equation at that point and start a new line with the slope we get there. All right, so let's plug in to dy by dt when it t is 0.5 and y is 1.5. All right, we get two. All right, so this time around, we're going to take the line passing through the point 0.5 1.5 with slope two, All right? There's an equation for that line, right? Or you're just cleaning it up a bit, 2t, um, oh, that should be a minus, minus plus 0.5. All right, so here's the next line we're gonna use. All right, I'm gonna scroll back up. And from here, we're gonna take the line with slope two. and use that to approximate the next piece of the curve. And then we're gonna stop again at you know, one, so another 0.5 seconds later, and then whatever that endpoint L of one is. And we'll repeat this. So now we'll recorrect and pick another line segment. That's the basic idea. Good on just the motivation, the idea behind it. All right, so let me give you the formal way that it goes. For Euler's method, in order to approximate the solution to dy by dt is some function f of t and y with the initial condition y of t naught equal to y naught. You start off by choosing a small number h that's called your time step. So that's how long you wanna go in between each point where you stop and recorrect. And you get a sequence of times, right? So you have the initial time, whatever T naught is. T one is one time step later. So T naught plus H. T two is one time step after that. T one plus H or if you prefer to write it as T naught plus two H, it's two time steps after when you start. And in general, the kth T, TK, is equal to T naught plus K times your step size. All right, so those are giving you the T coordinates of all the points in these, these little line approximation here. Now we're gonna successively, successively compute a sequence of values that goes with this, the y coordinates. You have your y naught, that's the initial value you're given with the initial condition. Then you're gonna approximate first by the tangent line. And the y coordinate of the endpoint of that, y1, is equal to y naught plus your time step, 
times the slope f of t naught y naught. And then you're going to repeat. So then you're going to approximate by your new line. And at the end point of the second line segment, its y coordinate y2 is equal to y1 plus h times f evaluated at the previous point. Again, you repeat the kth value yk is equal to yk minus 1 plus the time step times you know, the slope f of tk minus 1, yk minus 1. And you know, we're using these little line segments to approximate the curve. Right? So the y coordinates yk is an approximation to the actual solution y of tk. All right, let me draw the picture one more time. All right, so first thing we do is break the time axis into pieces, which are all h apart, you know, the time step. Then we go ahead and we start off with you know, whatever your initial condition is. Approximate by the tangent line until we reach time t1. The end point here is t1, y1. And the slope of this line is equal to f of t naught y naught, which we get by looking at the differential equation itself. All right, now we correct. On the next interval, we're using the slope for the current point. Proceed again until you hit time t2. Compute the new y coordinate. And in between the slope is f of t1, y1, f evaluated at the previous endpoint. And then repeat, you know, continue making corrections as you go, you know, for each time interval using one line. You'll end up approximating your curve by, you know, a polygon instead of you know, one single line, which is definitely a better idea. All right, the concept all clear. Should we go on and do some examples? All right, so let's finish the one we were starting with, where we had dy by dt equal to t plus y. An initial condition y of 0 equal to 1. And I'm going to choose a time step of 0.1, so a fairly small h value. Let's set up a table of approximate values for the solution to this differential equation. All right, for each one, we're going to figure out what k is, what step we're on, the time, and the approximate y value. All right, starting with time 0 t naught is equal to zero, since the initial condition is at y of zero, and y naught is equal to one, again, given by the initial condition. All right, so now let's go one step later. We're gonna stop at t1 equal to you know, point 0.1, t naught plus the step size. And now we're gonna have to do a little bit of work to get y1 y1 is equal to y0 plus h times f of t0 y0, where f of t0 y0 is the sum, t0 plus y0. That's coming from the differential equation. All right, now let's plug in. The previous y value was 1. The time step is 0.1. 
and the previous t value was zero. Y1 is equal to 1.1. And this is approximating the actual solution at you know, T1, so at 0.1 second. All right, let's go to step two. T2 is you know, 0.1 seconds later, so 0.2. And Y2 will have to go back through the same process. Take the previous Y value plus the time step times F evaluated at the previous point. All right, so we'll plug in 1.1 for Y1, step size 0.1. 0 0.1 for T1 and 1.1 again for Y1 to get 1.22. Alright, so Y2, the endpoint of the second line segment, its Y value is 1.22. And now that's approximating Y at what time? Zero point two, good, at T two. All right, and let me do one more. Three, T three is point three. Y three is equal to the previous Y plus the time step times the previous T plus the previous Y. One point three six. All right, so our solution curve at time 0.3 is approximately 1.362. First example, all good. All right, let's do a second example where I change up the time step and the differential equation. And this time I just want a specific value, y of 0 0.15. All right, so I just have to go until I reach that value. Let's start off, what is my initial y value? Why not? Yeah, it's one. The initial condition says y of zero is equal to one. So y naught is one and t naught is zero. That's where we're going to start it off. All right, now let's get y one by taking y naught plus h times f, which in this case is cosine of y plus t. And we're going to evaluate that at E not comma y not. Plugging in one, a step size of 0 0.05 and zero for t naught, we can get one plus 0 0.05 times cosine of one, which is basically 1.027015. That's approximating y at what time? Good, at 0 0.05, at you know, T1, one time step in. All right, are we done or do we need to keep going? Yes, we need to keep going. We haven't hit y of 0.15 yet. All right, so we'll do it again. Y2 is equal to y1 plus the time step 
times cosine evaluated at y1 plus the previous time, 0 0.05. All right, stick this 1.02 stuff in for y1 in a calculator. It comes out to be like 1.050713. And that's giving us approximately the value of y at time 0 0.1, two time steps in. All right, we're still not done, so we got to go one further. y3, use the previous y and the previous t. comes out to be like 1.071105. And that is approximating y at time 0 0.15, which is what we were asked to find. All right, so here's the answer to our question. All right, everything seemed clear in that example as well? All right, let's take a look at one application here then. All right, so something we haven't done yet is a simple circuit. All right, so we're gonna look at an, a simple electric circuit that has a resistance of 12 ohms, an inductance of four Henry's, and it contains a battery with voltage 60 volts. All right, so let's draw a little circuit diagram. We've got our battery with 60 volts. It's attached to a resistor with resistance 12 ohms and an inductor with inductance 4 Henry's. And then we've got a switch in the circuit. All right, let's assume that we close the switch at time t equal to zero, which means the current at the start is just zero amps. There's nothing running through the circuit until we close the switch. Let's estimate the current in the circuit half a second later. All right, so we're gonna to need to set up a differential equation that describes the current at time t. We'll use a few physical laws here to do that. We've got Ohm's law, which says the drop in voltage due to the resistor is R times I. And we have another law that says the voltage drop due to the inductor is gonna be L, the inductance, times DI by DT. All right now, one of Kirchhoff's laws implies that if I add the two together, you know, the voltage drop over the resistor plus the voltage drop over the inductor, you know, we get the total voltage change, right? So our differential equation here is LDI by DT plus RI is equal to V. All right, let's plug in the given values. L was four Henry's. R was 12 ohms and the voltage is constant at 60, since we just have a constant source of the battery at 60 volts. The only unknown here then is I. You know, what's the current at time T? All right, so this is an equation that we could actually solve. It is first order linear. So we could go through and find the integrating factor, yada, yada, yada. But let's just do this using an approximation in Euler's method instead. In order to do that, we need to separate the derivative. All right, so I'm going to get di by dt by itself by subtracting 12i and then dividing everything by 4. di by dt is 15 minus 3i. And 
put back in the initial condition and that the current at time zero is zero. All right, that means we're choosing I not to be zero and T not to be zero. All right, I need to pick a time step. Let's take H to be 0.1. The smaller the time step, the better the approximation. All right, so I'm gonna take what I consider to be fairly small 0.1. And now let's go through and find I at 0.5, half a second later. I1 is equal to I0 plus the time step times our function 15 minus 3I evaluated at the initial point. That's 0 plus 0.1 times 15 minus zero, or 1.5. Right, that's estimating the current at what time value? Point 0.1, good. All right, so we've got an idea that the current at 0.1 second is about 1.5 amps. Let's do it again. I2 relies on the previous one. So we'll plug in I1, the 1.5. Same step size. And calculate that out to be 2.55, which is giving us an estimate on the current to 0.2 seconds later. All right, we need to repeat this a bunch of times. Okay, if I skip to the end. And I guess at the same time, what step am I skipping to? If I want to know I of 0.5, what's K in that situation? Five, good. All right, so if I repeated five times, we get 4.15965 amps. All right, so that gives us the approximate current at time half a second later. Everything clear yet again? All right, so Euler's method is very nice in the sense that once you get a feel for the formula, it's pretty straightforward and we can you know, do this you know, over and over again. The downside to Euler's method is it's not hugely accurate. Let me see if I can find a picture. The further out you go, the more error you introduce because each time is dependent on the last step. So every time, you're introducing a little bit more error. And you're still gonna end up you know, with an approximation that's you know, not great the further out you go. There are tons of numerical methods out there for approximating solutions to differential equations. It's a really neat field of study. If you like it, you would take a course in numerical analysis. Euler's method is the only one we're gonna see in this class just because it is so nice and straightforward. But I wanted to mention that there's a lot more out there if you like this kind of thing. Tomorrow we're gonna to come back and I'm gonna spend a day or two reviewing everything we've seen for differential equations. All of the methods, when to apply them, applications of different types. So we're gonna go through all that good stuff over the next day or two. That way, when we go to start systems of differential equations, we're fully prepared. All right, so that's where we're heading. Got any questions for me before you leave for the day? All right, so don't forget again that you have that written homework due tomorrow by midnight. It's short, but give yourself some time to work on it. All right, thank you all, and I hope to see you back uh, tomorrow.